Life in the central United States depends on the Mississippi River and its 2,340 miles of riverway, starting at Lake Itasca in Minnesota until it reaches the Gulf of Mexico in Louisiana. From the Appalachians to the Rockies, its river basin covers 1.2 million square miles, touching 31 states, and provides drinking water for 18 million people. Today, that water is under threat. It is also among the most productive agricultural regions in the world. The majority of U.S. row crops and livestock are raised in its basin. Each year, farms contribute, along with cities and wastewater treatment plants, millions of tons of nutrients into the Gulf. To improve the quality of lakes, streams, and drinking water, and reduce the size of the Gulf's hypoxic zone, plans call for reducing nutrients entering the Mississippi River by 45%. There are dead zones in various coastal waters around the United States and around the world. Uh, they're caused by having uh, too much nutrients in the water. So that's nitrogen and phosphorus, which are uh, good in limited amounts in waterways. But when there's too much of them, then you have uh, algal blooms, those uh, green mats or blue-green algae that grow. And when they die, they soak up the oxygen. And so there's too little oxygen then in the water for fish, for uh, uh, shellfish, for worms, clams, all kinds of things that live in the water and every kind of animal needs oxygen to live. We have the Hypoxia Task Force which is tasked with improving water quality in the Gulf of Mexico uh, by improving water quality in the Mississippi River. And we have SENUSA, which is tasked with increasing the amount of perennial grasses on the landscape, grasses like switchgrass, uh, for purposes of biofuel production. And it turns out that one of the benefits of using perennial grasses like switchgrass on the landscape, uh, if strategically placed, can mitigate the flow of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus into waterways like the Mississippi River. So people are concerned about that. Uh, both um, on the impacts on, on food webs and the aquatic systems, but also uh, impacts on fisheries and recreation and all the other sorts of industries and livelihoods that people depend on in those coastal systems. What consistently emerges as the greatest contributors are, are land use, predominantly agriculture. These annual row crops like corn and soybeans are, are very leaky. A lot of the work that we're doing is just really trying to reconstruct uh, in the landscape uh, those sort of systems, those perennial systems that are kind of based on tall grass prairie principles that will intercept uh, nutrient flow, water flow, and recycle those nutrients, keep them on the land where they're applied or at, near the land where they're applied. That we need to, to look at land use changes and that would involve perennial grasses being able to be on the landscape at appropriate places, both where they make sense agronomically but I think it'll also be where they make sense in a water quality aspect as well, maybe as filter strips and other places uh, that, that could be of great value um, in addition to the working landscapes that are out there. Kathy Kling and Jason Hill are conducting research with SEN USA related to the role of perennial grasses in improving water quality of the Mississippi River watershed. My group and my role in the project is really to focus on water quality aspects associated with perennials. And in particular, we're developing a large modeling system to look at how perennials strategically placed in the landscape can reduce the amount of nutrients going into rivers and streams and ultimately impacting the Gulf of Mexico and the size of the hypoxic zone there. So our modeling research really is in two areas. One is a landscape level approach in which we look at different ways of putting biomass on the landscape and what the effects are of that on say water quality and air quality. The other way is the life cycle approach where we look at the supply chain, everything that goes into the production and use of different biofuels and look at effects on say water quality and air quality. The analysis that we're doing I hope will be useful information to policymakers and all interested stakeholders in better understanding the trade-offs. The strategy of using bioenergy perennial grass crops to help improve water quality is not without challenges for farmers. 
companies and there's strong market incentives for farmers to grow the crops that they grow. There's a big demand for corn and prices for those commodity crops are high so you can get um, sort of your best return on your, on your investment by uh, growing some of those traditional commodity crops. You know I guess it comes down to trying to not make the farmer's system any more complicated or, or time consuming than it already is. So really by turning it into another crop and in that it's a low risk crop because basically if you look at it like you're not going to fertilize it or really spend a whole lot of money on it, it's going to catch your nutrient that you would lose anyway, so in some respect it's going to save you money. That, that's a way to implement it and really just having the market for the biomass I see is the big, big point. You know, I think sometimes from the outside it can look like agriculture is all the same and always been the same. We drive past that field of corn and it was a field of corn last year or three years ago and, and so we don't see the changes and yet as farmers we see significant changes and, and one of the things that, that farmers are always looking to do is to do a better job next year and they're all looking for changes and opportunities and I believe we can leverage that into some great positive changes for the environment, for, for the economics within our rural community. So I, I really do believe there's a strength in the opportunity that farmers always look for in change that could be very important to us making good, positive, long-term changes.